to have one of America's greatest preachers here tonight, Dr. Harold Seidler. I doubt if anybody, including Dr. Seidler, knows how many times he's preached revival meetings throughout this area and around the world, but week after week after week after week after week after week, in addition to being the president of the school there, Tabernacle School, College, for the preacher boys, head of the children's home, pastor of the church, preaching in conferences, the Bright Spot Hour, and that's, that's, that's an appropriate name for that radio broadcast. It's the Bright Spot Hour. You can turn across your dial and hear Dr. Siley. You found a bright spot. You can park there. It's a bright spot. It'll be a bright spot in your day any time you hear Dr. Harold Seidler. We're honored to have him here tonight. Dr. Seidler, you come preach for us. This morning I mentioned he, he had six commentaries. He's offering for $20, and uh, you went over and bought every single one of them. But tomorrow... They're going to bring some more in. So if you wanted Dr. Seidler's commentaries, six of them for twenty dollars, and did not get them, there'll be a new supply here tomorrow, and uh, the rest of the week they'll keep sending back and getting more as long as you buy them. Dr. Seidler, we're glad to have you. Hey, open your Bibles to Isaiah fifty-three. Isaiah fifty-three. If you have a Scofield, it's page seven hundred. If you don't have a Schofield, you're leaving under a great disadvantage. <laughs> it's just Schofield reference Bible and study it. In verse 1, who hath believed our report? A question. I'll be back to that question after a moment. And then to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Question number 2. I'd like to say something about that. And then in verse 8, who shall declare his generation? The three questions of Isaiah chapter 53. Now when you read the chapter, you'll find that these are the only three. And by the way, I have this sermon in print in one of my smaller books down there on the table under the title, The Three Questions of Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor commonness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now watch that. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they're foolishness unto him. The natural man will never love the Lord Jesus. Only by a work of grace can a man love the Bible and love the Lord Jesus, love the church. He, is, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our, uh, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and uh, uh, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet we opened, he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the, to the slaughter, and as a sheep uh, to her sharers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Let me read, uh, let me say just a word before I read it further. Note the masculine gender in all these uh, pronouns, a he and his and so on, with the one exception in verse number seven, her sharers, as a sheep for her sharers. Wonder why you change the gender from the masculine to the feminine in that one place in the entire chapter. It shows how minutely inspired of God the scriptures are. Only a, a, a female sheep is dumb before the sharers. The male sheep is not. Uh, but Jesus was, uh, was dumb as a female sheep before his sharers. And so I have to give the picture the true meaning, the gender was changed by the inspiring spirit of God. A man having written the Bible would not have done that. He would have continued using the masculine pronoun. The Bible indeed is verbally inspired, word by word, <laughs> verbally inspired. And I have that verse underscored, the pronoun her underscored, because I don't want to ever forget that. It's a good illustration of verbal inspiration. Before her shares is done, so he opened not as a female lamb, he opened not his mouth either. He was taken from uh, prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he shall be cut off out of the land 
of the living for the transgression of my uh, my people was he stricken. He was made, he made his grave with the wicked and uh, with the rich in his death because he, had, because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord, it pleased God to bruise him, for he hath put him to grief uh, when he shall make him an offering for sin. He shall see his uh, seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall uh, uh, the pleasure of the Lord uh, shall he uh, shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. That he is dead assure us that we're on the winning side. He shall see the travail of his soul, and uh, shall be satisfied. And you can be assured of that. God made that promise. Jesus shall see the travail of his soul. He'll see the fruit of that which he has done. He see the he'll see the victory of that which he did when he died upon Calvary. He shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be satisfied. His knowledge shall my righteous servant uh, justify many, for he shall uh, uh, be uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the small with the strong, because he hath uh, he hath pour, poured out his soul unto death, and the uh, was numbered with the transgressors, uh, and bear the sins of many. He made intercession for the transgressor. Isaiah chapter 53. Now I'd like to project to you the three questions that I find uh, in the chapter tonight. I want you to mark them in verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And number 2, uh, uh, the second question in, along with that, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And the third question related, and who shall declare his generation? Who shall declare the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, how would you interpret those uh, three questions? You remember the Ethiopian eunuch riding back to his native land in the chariot had a copy of Isaiah, and he didn't understand that which you read and said so to Philip that he didn't understand that which you read. If you had only the 53rd chapter of Isaiah in a scroll with note 52 and note 54, only that one chapter, how would you interpret these three questions that I'm, I'm pointing out to you, especially verse number one? There'd be no way that you could find the interpretation of the, of the, of the correct interpretation, at least, of the question of verse one, who hath believed our report? What's Isaiah talking about? Remember now, you don't have any context. You have only the 53rd chapter. What would you say about that question? Or to whom is the honor of the Lord revealed? How would you answer that? without a context, you see. It would be utterly impossible, as far as I'm concerned, for you to come up with the right answer. It's no small wonder that the eunuch said, of whom does the prophet speak? Uh, explain it to me. Tell me what he's talking about, because he only had this chapter to look at. Uh, the only way you can find the answer to question number one and two is in the context. Now, the context are the verses that precede that's, that means if we look at chapter 52 and the latter part of the chapter to find the answer to the question in chapter 53. And there's something that I want you to see and not forget for all the remaining days of your life. Look back at verse number, uh, number 13 in chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted. He shall be extolled. He shall be very high. And uh, many were astonished at thee. Now, uh, that first uh, uh, verse number 13 says some great and profound things about Jehovah's servant. Jehovah's servant is a picture and type of the Lord Jesus himself. And uh, he's, uh, he said in verse 13 that Jehovah's servant shall, be, shall deal prudently, shall deal wisely. He's too wise to do wrong, and he's too good to do wrong. He deals, deals prudently. And when Isaiah said that, all the people would have said, Amen, Amen. That describes the Messiah. We believe he's that kind of a Messiah, an all-wise uh, king, all-wise Lord he is. And so everybody would have said, Amen, in Isaiah's congregation, as he said, he shall deal wisely. And then Isaiah continued to say, and he shall be exalted. And again, the people said, Amen, be high and lifted up. Paul said that 
in Philippians about the Lord Jesus. I have given him a name that is above every name, that every knee shall bow to that name, and every tongue shall confess that he's God to the glory of God the Father. And so when Isaiah said he should be exalted, the people said, Amen, that's great, Isaiah, you're preaching the truth. Our Messiah is a great God, highly exalted God, and you're telling the truth, and the amens were abundant as Isaiah declared that. And then third, Isaiah continued by saying, he shall be extolled. His name shall continually fall from the lips of many people. His name shall be extolled and spread abroad around all the world. And again, the people said, Amen, Isaiah, a truthful that is, and we appreciate that and we believe that, and we give you a hearty Amen. His name indeed shall be extolled. And then number four, he said, He shall be very high, the Lord Jesus, exalted above every other name exalted above every other religious leader. Never has there been one like our Lord Jesus Christ. Never has there been one born like he. Never has there been one who died as he died. Never has there been one that came out of the grave on the third day as he did. Never has there been one to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God on high as he does. Never has there been one that promised, I will come again as he promised. And surely the people said, Amen, that's great Isaiah. That's good preaching. We like to hear that the people might have well said about Isaiah's sermon. But look at verse 14. In verse 14 he says, And many shall be astonished at thee. And the amens dried up. They said, well, What do you mean by that? And many shall be astonished at thee. You've just finished saying he shall deal prudently. You've just finished saying he shall be exalted. You just declared to us a moment ago he shall be extolled. And uh, we, uh, his name will be lifted above all of the names. Uh, and now you talk about people being astonished. Why would you say that, Isaiah? And the amen stopped. No amens to that. He shall be astonished. The people shall be astonished. Many shall be astonished at thee. And then second, his visage was so marred more than any other man. And the form of his body so marred more than the sons of man. And the amens were silent as death. No more Jews saying amen. Now, now what, what's happening here? In verse number 13, the Messiah is highly exalted and glorified highly, as high as Isaiah can glorify him. But in verse number 14, you see the humiliation of our Lord. And there's where the trouble starts. It started back in the days of Isaiah, and it abounds in our day. The difficulty in our day uh, is the humiliation of Christ. Right. As long as he's king, people get on the bandwagon. But when he's not king, not many will bow their knee to him otherwise, you see. The humiliation of Christ. Israel wanted a Christ highly exalted, without a cross, without trouble, without blood, without shame, without a reproach. But God did not give that kind of a, of a Christ. God allowed his son to be born to die. Born crucified he was. Born crucified. And the world is filled up with people in North Carolina today that will not bow their knee to a humiliated Savior. Why, when he died, Israel in his day said he could not be the Messiah. Well, look at him. They're, they're, they're putting him to death. He's dying upon the cross. He could not be the Son of God. They reasoned. And the reason they reasoned so was because of his humiliation. In our day across America, people clamor for a popular religion. They want a popular religion. They want a religion without any cross-bearing. They want a religion without any sacrifice. They want a religion without any reproach. They want the applause of the world along with their religion. And my soul, there's no such thing as that. There has never been and there'll never be a glamorous Christian faith. There's a cross to be born. There's a Savior to follow. And, I, and Isaiah knew well the cross. And all the other writers knew well the cross and the reproach of Christ. And in our day, we bear that same reproach for believing this book, for following a lowly Nazarene. The world wants somebody glamorous, somebody popular. And the Antichrist will be that popular man at the end of the age. And false Christ in our day gather great throngs about them, false leaders, 
false prophets gather great throngs about them. And now it is popular to follow a popular leader, whether he's right or whether he's wrong. But the test of a man's faith is what he believes about this book and what he believes about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Whose son is he? Now, if you can confidently say, he's God's only begotten Son and my personal Savior, then you'll fall in line and bear the cross and carry the reproach. But if you're looking for a popular way, you'll fall by the wayside. It isn't always popular. You stand for Jesus, some of your relatives will turn upon you. You stand for the Bible, and some of your peers uh, will look down at the end of the noses at you. You believe the Bible, and some church will have nothing to do with you. You stand as a fundamentalist. Uh, I am a fundamentalist. If that be treason, you make the most of it. I've always been a fundamentalist Bible believer. I am tonight as much as I've ever been. And shall always be. Now, that's a crime in some circles. But as far as I'm concerned, it's the only way to believe the Bible, to take the Bible at face value. Now, Israel, like 1992, wanted a popular Savior. And as long as Isaiah was talking about the Savior being extolled and being exalted and acting wisely, then they were happy. They were saying the amen. But the moment Isaiah touched the humiliation of Christ, the amens dried up. He sh many should be astonished. Many should be astonished, said Isaiah, and they didn't say amen. Known to that, his visage, his face will be marred, his body will be marred. And uh, they didn't understand that, no amens. And he went on to say in verse number 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. And that was almost an unpardonable sin for Isaiah to say that. The Jew, till our day, is a peculiar people. They are monotheistic. They're God's elect chosen people. I don't doubt that one bit, not a bit. I recognize them as God's chosen people. I'm not a Jew. Don't have one ounce of Jew blood in my veins. If I did, I'd be proud to tell you so. I'm a Gentile. I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody. I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. If I could trace my steps from my, from my cradle to my manhood, I find nothing within me but a fitness to be damned. No righteousness of my own. If I have any righteousness at all, it's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, my Lord. In my hand, no price do I bring, but except to his cross I claim. I don't know the way, but I know he who is the way. And Isaiah said he should sprinkle them in the nations. You mean our Messiah sprinkled him in the nations? That's exactly what he said. And here's the result of it in the local church in 1992. Local born-again people. Who would have thought it? Who would have imagined? Jews did not imagine that. The world would have never come to that. But it was God's purpose and plan from the foundation of the world to bring out a Gentile body as we are in our day. And then it went on to say in verse number 15, And the king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which uh, had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. And so all the amens dried up. The humiliation of Christ was more than Isaiah's day could take. They wanted a popular religion, exactly as in 1992. Men want a popular religion. And churches want a popular religion. And many churches are represented in this great assembly tonight. Uh, you pattern your service and your services to try to attract uh, popular people in your city. It can't be done. One man in Greenville said, we're going out after the executives. We're going to try to win the back presidents to God. You're wasting your time. Not many great are chosen, not many noble are chosen, but God has chosen the weak things to confound the mighty. You're going to win souls, you're going to get them from humble people and common people. From nobody's like we are. Not many mighty are chosen. And the idea of going out after the executive, uh, that's a popular way. You don't have that. They want popular music, popular dress standards, popular standards of conduct. In our day, you draw the line, right down the line. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, 
Thou shalt not commit adultery. And people turn away from you and say, you're a legalist. But it says, wrong for a man to commit adultery now as it was when Moses lived. Yeah. It says, wrong for a man to be dishonest now as it ever has been. Yeah. And we have no right to try to make it popular, to dress it up. We want a fancy religion to satisfy people that are carnal, and that kind just doesn't work. Now, with that kind of a backdrop, you can understand why Isaiah said, who hath believed our report? Right? In other words, Isaiah is saying, now, Lord God, if we preach that kind of a gospel, we might just as well stay home. And that's right. Who hath believed our report? If we go out and preach the kind of gospel uh, that you set out and set forth in chapter 52, nobody will believe that. And that's just about the truth. You're not going to get a sinner converted without the Holy Ghost getting a hold of his heart in conviction. <laughs> without the Spirit of God doing his free work, a lost man will never bow his knee to Jesus. But I want to say to you, when the Spirit of God gets hold of a sinner, he'll crawl to that altar like a dead dog. He'll plead for mercy when the Spirit of God gets a hold of him. Who hath believed our report, said Isaiah. This gospel... My generation will not accept, said Isaiah. And I want to say to you, the gospel of a crucified Savior, a humiliated Savior, a suffering Savior has never been popular. It's not popular today and will never be popular. Who hath believed our report? But I submit to you, the only gospel we have to preach is the gospel of a crucified Christ yeah. upon the cross, suffering bleeding, dying, humiliated, cursed by wicked men, nailed to a Roman cross in shame and agony and suffering and dying, lifted dead from the cross and buried in a Sadducee's grave. That's the Christ that I bow my knee to. And that's the Christ you bow your knee to. Now the time is coming when indeed he shall be glorified, but not now. Not now. He's a humiliated Christ tonight. Who hath believed our report? I'd like to hold my hand up and say, Lord God, I believe it. I believe it. I believe in Jesus Christ, crucified upon Calvary. I received him as my Lord, as my Savior. He's not glamorous, and the world don't recognize him, and the world rejects him, but I believe. Who hath believed our report? You believe. And every other sinner convicted by the Spirit of God and brought to a knowledge of Christ will confess him as Lord. Who hath believed our report? And then question number two. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I read a moment ago, he shall sprinkle them into nations. That shook those Jews to the very foundation. While we are the chosen people, they might have thought, when Isaiah said that, we're God's elect people. And you're talking about him uh, sprinkling many nations. Who are you talking about, Isaiah? Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord can reveal only, they thought, to Israel. But God had greater purposes than that. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I'd like to hold my hand up and say again, it's revealed to a Gentile generation of sinners saved in God's grace. Isn't that amazing that God would be mindful of me? An alien from the commonwealth of Israel, without God and without hope, without any price, without any merit, without any virtue, without any heritage. My people were barbarians. My people came from Europe to this country in 1758, and they were not far away from a barbaric condition in Europe when they came to this beloved land. And uh, I have no heritage. My people built no temples. They wrote no Bibles. And some of your people wrote no Bibles either. And some of your people built no temples. We came out of a primitive barbaric condition in Europe or some other uh, European country or African country, country and came to this land, a, a group of nobodies, nobodies. My people had no priests. My people had no prophets. My preacher, my people had true preachers, but the priests out of this book. They had no prophets. They wrote no scriptures.
but God had me in mind when Jesus died of Calvary. He shall sprinkle many nations. And I'm so glad the crucified Christ died not only for the Jew, but we Gentiles as well. And not a man is excluded. Christ died by the Adam's fallen race. I don't accept the idea of limited atonement. Christ died for every sinner. And whosoever will, that includes we nobodies. And you had the quicken who were dead in sins and in trespasses. Well, that includes us. Uh, who hath bleed our heart? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then Isaiah has a third question in verse 8. He said, who shall declare his generation? Which is his way of saying, now, Lord God, if this is the gospel we're to preach, there'll be no preachers volunteer. And that's just the truth. That's right. Liberalism produces no preachers. Unfaith produces no preachers. Vain religion produces no preachers. A uh, refrigerator produces no preachers. Forms of godliness produce no preachers. False religion produces no preachers. But you get the faith moving, the faith and truth moving, and that generates preachers. And Isaiah said, who shall declare? Not in Israel, he says. We Jews will not preach that kind of a gospel. Who shall declare his generation? Isaiah, I'd like to lift my hand and say, I shall declare it. I shall declare it. And I've been trying to tell this story with a feeble voice for 53 years. I don't want to stop. Sometimes my physical condition gets where I can hardly put one foot ahead of another, but I'll keep going. Keep on preaching. I find no place to turn around. I find no place to quit. I have no desire to quit. The most wonderful thing I've ever tried to do in my life is what I'm trying to do right now. Amen, amen, amen. Amen! You feel sorry for me? Don't waste your pity on me, brother. I'm having a time. I enjoy declaring his name. I'm not going to declare another person's name, but I sure love to declare his name. I would I, would, I could sing like Brother Bill, like these young folk that sang a moment ago. I can't do that. I would that I could write like Brother Curtis or Dr. Rice. I can't do much of that. But I can stand up and say, Jesus is wonderful. Yeah. His name is wonderful. Yeah. Who shall declare his name? And I volunteer. Yeah. Hear him, Lord, send me. Yeah. Well, you haven't gotten much of a voice. Send me in a way. Yeah. You're about worn out. Send me in a way. Yeah. You're about to die. Send me in a way. Yeah. I want to declare his name till I come to die. Who shall declare his name? Now, this great assembly of people, fundamental Bible-believing people, at the sword conference, say, Lord, send me. Yeah. And every one of us are Gentiles, but we say, Lord, send me. Yeah. And you know, he does that. He does that. Amen. He'll send you. If you don't mean it, you better not offer yourself. He'll send you. <laughs> if God call me, he'll call you. If you'll stay around the Lord, you'll wind up preaching too. And it's not so bad. Amen. Who hath believed our report? I believe. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? To me. Who shall declare his generation? By his grace, I shall. Our Father, thank you for the text. And I pray you may use the text to encourage every person within our gates tonight. Thank God for the sword conference. Thank God for the sword of the Lord. Thank God for Dr. Rice, who founded this great work many years ago. And for Curtis Hudson, who's carried on in such a noble and efficient and sufficient way. Thank God for this great church that opened their doors to this beautiful complex for the sword conference in 1992. And I pray your blessed gospel light and Dr. Robinson for their generous hospitality. And all of these good folk from our neighboring states and distant states that we heard mentioned a while ago, make them feel their welcome in North Carolina at the Sword Conference tonight. In Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen.